Once was a land of woe and strife, where the people were bereft of hope. They prayed to their gods of might and light to deliver the heroes of old. Instead they got heroes, did you hear the quotes in my voice of moral ambiguity? They may help or may not help you at all Depends on what's in it for them They kick and they punch and they maul and they smash They lie and they scheme and they burn and they slash Succeed or fail, it adds to the tale Dungeons and debacles starts now Hello and welcome to this special episode of the Dungeons and Debacles podcast Today is a level up episode Our villains have hit level 8 finally and we're going to take this opportunity to talk about the characters, what choices they made at level 8, how they've changed since the uh, campaign has gone along, and a description of them. So, who wants to go first? No, I'm going to ask you to too much. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, talk a little bit about uh, Lunados. All right, well, Lunados is an 8th level elven monk. He is... He pulls the way of the uh, fist. He, he fists things. Um, he's really good at punching, although right now he's using a quarter staff plus one. He can also heal people, um, which he has never used it for, because he's better off punching people, really. Um, he's got a whole lot of magic stuff, more than he can actually use, so he's limited to his robes, his cloak, and his boots at the moment. Uh, what what yeah. do they do? Um, cloak protection plus one. Robes give him plus one to AC, initiative, and dexterity saves. And his boots are boots of speed. Let him uh, let him move really, really fast. And gives him an extra attack per round, which is useful. Also gives him bonus to AC when they're activated. So you're not using the uh, brooch anymore? Nope. Plus one wisdom, plus one charisma can go to someone else. Except we have so much magic stuff, I don't know. <laughs> If he had one more wisdom, then using that brooch would make a difference. As it is, it doesn't make too much difference. Also not using the, the Lucky Charm or either of the rings at the moment. But at, if need be, at later times, they could be brought in. He might attune the Ring of Disguise self uh, when they make their way into Kala. Because that might be useful. Or maybe Juliet should use that because she's the person who's known in town. And uh, Alexander is as well. Mm-hmm. Although far less so because he wasn't a guardsman. True. But the, but the fact is they're both magic users with disguise spells, so not especially necessary. All right. Tell us a little bit about Alunados. Who is well, he? He What's grew up? up in a monastery way off in the woods, uh, northwest, or I think it was northwest, of uh, the Feydale. So he doesn't know too much about cities and uh, doesn't like them very much, considers them sort of weak and and useless, and they make people bad. And um, the one time they went into a major city where it was kind of an issue, he kind of freaked the fuck out, and that was in uh, Feydale. Feydale? Fey City? The big elf city. Feydale, yep. What's he look like? He is... uh, a little bit shorter than average human, kind of skinny, uh, 125, doesn't weigh all that much. And um, he's, he's pretty brown, brownish skin, brown hair, or brown red skin, uh, brown eyes, brown hair. Although if his hair was dyed, it might have been, it, it, we dyed it black at some point, it might still be black, or his roots might be showing, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I would say that elves' hair probably grows pretty slowly, uh, along with the rest of them. So it's probably still. But it wasn't a black. permanent dye, so it's probably faded. Yeah, it was just ink. <laughs> it probably washed out by now, for all we know. Uh, depends on how often a lunatoth bathes. It's an interesting question. I'll have to consider that. <laughs> so, uh, talk a little bit about uh, his motivations. He um, is a follower of Ruinaxis. That's the monastery he was in, was devoted to Ruinaxis. So he is all in for freeing this ancient red dragon. 
considers himself the good guy and has absolutely no qualms about doing what is necessary. Um, he, he's not like you know chaotic evil or anything like that. He doesn't go around trying to do stuff because he's a dick. It's just that you know if a kid has to die, it's not really too big a problem for him. So he would be. Would you consider him neutral evil? Uh, yes, that is his alignment, neutral evil. All right. Um, talk a little bit about uh, your relationships with the uh, the rest of the group here. Um, he is kind of an uncle dad figure to Talia because they uh, they bonded early on over a uh, a shared experience breaking into a shop and, and stealing a whole lot of shit and making a lot of money. Um, the money was less important to Luno, hence why he gave most of it away. <laughs> uh, Juliet um, kind of shares that relationship, so they are kind of odd couple parents to Talia. And other than that, you know, it's it's you know, not super close just because they, they often get fractious about uh, the goals of the party because Juliet is not quite so blasé about the evil stuff and the disdain for the gods that Elutidas has. At least I don't think so. Uh, Alexander um, seems a bit standoffish. Doesn't uh, uh, get participate quite so fully in their activities. Doesn't seem quite so devoted to uh, the whole Ruin Axis thing. And no, Luna still doesn't trust the person who betrayed and murdered his former party. Uh, Vic, she's new, but she is also religious, so Alunadas likes that. Lord Dust likes his fellow member of faith, even though it's the wrong faith. She worships that that spider lady instead of, you know, the, a dragon like decent people do. Well, I mean, Juliet worships a dragon, well, the god of dragons. Mm hmm, mm hmm. But she's not quite, you know, devoted. She, she, she seems weird about the Ruin Axis thing. I don't get it. She's a. Uh... She's a uh, uh, an uh, an Easter and Christmas kind of uh, Tiamat worshiper, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. She she just goes through the motions of sacrificing babies. I think. Yeah. All right. Uh, so tell us what's happening in Eighth Level. What did uh, what'd you get? Not much. Uh, level eight is just the ability point increase. So obviously his hit points went up. He got another cheat point. Um, but instead of the increasing my ability points by two, I decided to get mobility as a feat. Because, um, well, first off, it increases his speed by two. So now, what with all of his bonuses so far, Alunodas has a base movement speed of 12. Which is like two to three times a normal walking speed for um, most people. Um, do you mean or 12 squares? Per- yeah, 60 feet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so most people are five or six. So Lunadas is ridiculously fast there. And if he double clicks, you know, clicks his heels together, you know, turns on his boots of speed, then obviously all of a sudden his speed goes up to 24 um, or 120 feet per round. So Lunadas is running around all over the place now. Uh, and then and you can mob- dash too. Mm-hmm. With mobility... Um, on dash, difficult terrain no longer hinders you. Uh, doesn't uh, uh, in- decrease your movement speed any. So, um, if Luna were to dash, then he would be going 48 or 240 feet per round. Which, I can't remember what that would translate to in miles per hour, but it would be really fast. It'd be like 20 some odd miles an hour, I think. Uh, it'd probably be more like 40, I think. Uh, that's just insane. It really is. Um, so, uh, anything else you want to talk about with uh, Luna? It's 27 miles per hour. There we go. (laughs) Um, and also, one last thing for mobility, uh, which will make him really a lot more mobile, is that when you make a melee attack against a creature, whether it hits or not, you no longer get opportunity attacks, or trigger opportunity attacks from them for the rest of the turn. So with his five attacks, he can, you know, move, attack, move, attack, move, attack. He can just be moving around on the battlefield without having to worry about uh, triggering attacks of opportunity quite so much. Yeah, you never have to use disengage again. Mm Mm-hmm. And that means that if I want to set up flanking with someone, I can do that. 
Um, I can use my uh, ability to push people around um, with uh, the flurry of blows to try and rearrange the battlefield a little bit, things like that. So that's what I'm hoping for with this feat. Awesome. Indeed. All right. Well, who wants to go next? I'll hop on next. I need to go cook. Ugh. Meth dealers. (laughs) I'm I'm not even under (laughs) one anymore. (laughs) All right, Shane, tell us about Alexander. Uh, So Alexander is a uh, late 20-ish, I want to say, human dude. He, his family was uh, subject to loan sharks and stuff due to gambling debts. They ran off, left the debts to him. I ran off and then uh, kind of fell into the swing of things. Learning music on the way to make some money. Blase, blase, story point, story point. Uh, lead up to the point where we initiated this whole thing with Julia and everybody. Murdered half of our companions due to differences in values. And then... It kind of led us to where we are now. Um, did we decide where Alexander's from? Was it Lascaux? I don't think so. I don't think we've uh, established a canon starting point. But, I mean, Lascaux works just as good as anywhere else. Okay. And then you just found yourself in, found yourself in Kala. Yep. <clears throat> so, you are a human bard. Um, you chose the College of Lore. Yep. Um, so what did you get at 8th level? So at 8th level, 8th level, not a lot. Uh, most of the big things are going to come at level 10. But for level 8, I got some more stat points, which I boosted into my charisma, giving it up to 20, and myself a 5 modifier. And then I switch out one of my spells. I switch out Comprehend Language for Heat Metal because one, it seems more evilly inclined and useful. And two, since we have the magic book from the magic college, I can just cast it as a uh, as a ritual out of combat. And that's about everything I got. Gotcha. Um, what's your... I know you said you don't really follow a god. What's your alignment? I, I'd probably say neutral evil, but i I'm not sure exactly like what line in the sand changes those alignments. Well, I think it's all fluid, but the alignment to me is just like the the base of you're like your starting point where you move because evil people can do good things and good people can do bad things and lawful people can do chaotic things and chaotic people can do and lawful Alexander things. Alexander is still lawful good through and through. I've just run into a, a rough, rough rut. But yeah, so, I'd say neutral evil. So what's, what's your motivation? Uh, I think my initial motivation was to just kind of kind of make my way through the waves, get some money, and pass on. But uh, as things started to develop, I got a bit more invested due to outside forces. And then I kind of got put into a, uh, a rough place where half of the party was like, no, nah, we're not doing that. And I'm like, well, it's got some pretty good benefits. It's better than the other thing. Uh, and because of that, murdered off half the party and uh, started on the journey to raise Ruin Axis. And now it's like, uh, it's where I'm at. And I mean, to be fair, Red Talons have dental. They do. <laughs> good benefits. So uh, talk a little bit about your uh, relationships with the uh, rest of the party. Uh, Alexander sees uh, Illuminos as a bit of a, a whack case, since he just kind of goes off doing whatever he wants most of the time. Uh, Julia is usually the the hard charger on most uh, cases. Alexander doesn't really have strong opinions uh, either way, unless there's like very strong detrimental reasons why not to do something or to do something. And Ale- uh, Juliet's usually better at wrangling along the the group of misfits. Uh, Talia is pretty, pretty sick. Got a dog. Pets the dog. Trains the dog. Hangs out with Juliet a lot. Kind of like a uh, Juliet's protege, I guess. Oh yeah, Vic. Uh, Vic's very, very rough-edged. Uh, not very open to uh, 
things that go against her beliefs as a paladin, which is reasonable. Can't can't fight that one. Almost forgot about Vic for a second, since it's been a been a little while. And I think that's I think that's everybody. And uh, going back to motivations, how does it uh, feel to be rid of the dagger? It's pretty exciting. Don't have to worry about being consumed every five minutes. Uh, don't have to worry about killing people on like a uh, on a quota basis. Well, you still do, but you got to pump up those numbers. Those now, are rookie it's numbers in this racket. It's, it's, it's for your sake. You do it yourself. It's a hobby. It's, it's a personal liberty now. Okay. Now it's a choice. Yeah, it's a choice and not a uh, not a debt collector coming for the bodies. All right. Um, anything? More importantly, uh, more importantly, we don't have to worry about him waking up in the middle of the night and trying to kill us, which is motivation for all of us to have done what we did. I still think we should have made friends with the demon. Well, how about you go make a contract with the demon? I said friends, not contract. I sent some multi-class warlock. <laughs> that sounds like a free Eldritch Blast to me. I mean, that was that's an option. Yeah, but I mean, I can just get Eldritch Blast at level 10 anyways. Or nons like your ex that you go crawling back to three months later. <laughs> hey, I know we've had our rough patches, but you know, I've always killed somebody for you. You'd uh, you'd kill me for no reason. I'd kill you for a very good reason. And do you still well, have my flannel? You're inconvenient. <laughs> I think no, I, I, I think I, I think I left my hoodie there too. <laughs> I think I left a little bit of my soul in your plane. Uh, but yeah, I think that about sums it up. Can't wait till level ten to get a bunch of uh, cool spells and things. Are you going to take, uh, what is it, magic secrets to get some spells from other classes? Yeah, I get two spells from other classes from the second layer of magic secrets. Uh, take shield and uh, eldritch blast. Pretty good. All right. Um, who wants to go next? I'll go. All right, Hannah, tell us about Talia. Uh, well, Talia... Uh, has changed actually quite a bit since the last time we leveled. Um, she's still rather small for her age, but I figure if she's 13, she's probably grown a bit. Uh, so she's now 4'10". Woo! And a whole 90 pounds. What? Very exciting. Um, for me, anyway. Uh, I realize nobody else cares. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but that's how she's changed uh, appearance-wise. She has gotten a little taller. She's got, you know, she's gained a bit more weight. She's looking a little bit healthier, which is always good. Um, when she reached level eight, uh, I just picked up. Um, I picked the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The stat change. The the ability score increase. Yeah, the ability score increase. I'm sorry, my brain just completely lost me on that one. Uh, I picked the ability score increase, and I upped my um, charisma and my dexterity. So now I get a plus four to my dexterity, and a plus three to my charisma, and it was a plus two to my charisma and a plus three to my dexterity before. So I, I gained uh, a pretty decent increase by, do by doing that. Um, since she's an arcane trickster, I was also able to pick up another spell. Um, so I picked up Misty Step. And since she changed level, I swapped out Fog Cloud for Shield. Uh, because I don't have anything to do with... I, I have nothing to use a, uh, a um, reaction on. So I figured doing that would be pretty, pretty useful, given... And, and, like, make her AC with Shield, like, 23, which is pretty fantastic. Um... Other than that, she because I considered doing a feat, and I might do a feat next time. We'll see. Um, but other than that, she hasn't really changed a whole lot. Um, I need to use her rapier more often because, like, it's really good, <laughs> and I haven't been using it. I also need to use mirror image more often because that would probably have saved her a lot of pain last uh, last episode when they were fighting the demon because uh, he would have had to pick you know, one of her instead of uh, specifically being able to target her. 
All right. Um, talk a little bit about uh, Talia's motivations. Um, I mean, at this point, now she's just having fun. There was a time when she was just kind of following along, trying to, you know, please the people that had saved her life. Now it's more like, uh, hey, this is a lot of fun, and I really enjoy killing people and stealing things. Let's continue doing that. <laughs> uh, that's And that's literally, that's her motivation, is she's enjoying herself. Um, she's not, she doesn't really care about the whole rune access thing could care less about that um but she's having fun and that's that's ultimately what matters uh is that she's you know with people who like her and doing things that she enjoys and getting rich in the process she is rolling in it right now uh she's got 4,325 gold and 500 plat you're not sharing that uh platinum uh, I mean, I will if people ask for it, but it's no one did, and she was the one who got the boot boots taken from her, so in her mind, it's hers, but she'll share it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just keeping it for you guys. Basically. <laughs> it's fine. All this is fine. I mean, ultimately, what's she gonna do? Go out and buy a castle? Like, let's... Uh, you she's just could, I guess. To use it, right? <clears throat> She has nothing to use it on right now, though, so... I don't know. There's no magic items she wants. She's got her daggers that she loves, and her rapier that she should use more often, and her cloak of the bat, which lets her fly. Like, I don't think there's anything other than maybe a herd of ponies that a young girl could want. <laughs> Mom, I can you... afford a herd of ponies. That's the thing. That's the sad part. Do you have any murder ponies? Yeah. Do you have... Do you guys... Okay, so, uh, do you have any ponies that, like, have a call for blood? Because, like, I want all of those. You could have a, uh, like, some sort of magic item that is, uh, is, uh, cast the fine steed spell. <laughs> no, she, she likes Estelle. Uh, she, she loves her Estelle, although... Given the fact that she's growing, she has considered going and getting a warhorse instead, but keeping Estelle for like a pack pony. Um, so we've established that uh, Talia is a little murder hobo. Um, oh, did absolutely. You, did you decide on a god, and uh, what's your alignment? Uh, neutral evil is my alignment, and I don't think that Talia is religious or has any desire to be religious. Um,. Because why, unless a god is going to do something for her, why should she worship someone when she can clearly kill things at will? Like, she doesn't see the point. You're going to be hanging with Asmodeus eventually. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> okay. If he can give her a herd of murder ponies, why not? Precisely. No, he, just, he just eats your soul. That's fine, then I don't have to worry about anything, because my soul's gone. And then I can't feel anything anyway. I had fun while it lasted. There you go. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your relationships with the rest of the uh, people in the party. Uh, like the, the people before me have said, uh, Alunidas and, and Juliet have kind of become the parent figures. Uh, as much as Alunidas wants to be, you know, the weird uncle... Uh, Talia's definitely seeing him more as a dad figure, uh, because Alexander is the weird uncle, um, <laughs> in her mind. Uh, she really likes Vic. Vic's like the weird aunt, uh, the cool weird aunt. Um, and yeah, no, it's very much like that's her family. And, and she may be a little murder hobo, but if someone threatens her family, she will kick their ass. Or at least do her very damnedest to. Uh, it's still on brand for a murder hobo. <laughs> <laughs> you like threw it a butt and then it's like, well, what do you mean butt? Okay, well then, yeah, no, she's definitely a little murder hobo. But it's fantastic. Uh, and I love it. No, she uh, she would definitely, like, if someone threatened her family. And I, I think it's, I think I've tried to play that in the past where, like, someone threatened her family and she was like, no, fuck you. And everything you stand for, I'm gonna kill you now. 
uh, and like that's that's who she is. That's what she stands for. Uh, and yeah, like it's definitely there's definitely a closer relationship with everyone than there was in the past, including Alexander. All right. Anything uh, else you want to say about Talia? Um, no. Oh, Abbott is just hanging out. Um, I know that it seems weird that she has this puppy, but I think that it gives a lot of good opportunities for uh, role play, or at least it will in the future, um, where they can, where, you know, it can help move the story along because we can be hanging out with Abbott and maybe talk about something like it's happened with Vic. Um, and just I like the idea of a little girl having, you know, having a puppy. Well, he's so more he's than a puppy, a puppy now. Anymore. He's yeah, no, like full-grown dog. He's probably grown. Yeah. So, but she—he all dogs are all doggos are puppers. Doesn't matter the age. All right. Uh, let's see, I think that leaves uh, Blake. Tell us yes, about uh, Juliet. Right. So Juliet is a young dragonborn. Obviously, very tall, about six foot two. Very muscular, blue eyes, red scales, has that draconic red heritage. She is a kind of combination. She started out as a city guard, so she has that very fighting martial training, but that quickly gave way to uh, a more spellcasty type of thing. And now she's multiclassed into wizard, and her fighter archetype is Eldritch Knight. So she's very, very, uh, <laughs> very book learned nowadays. Although you never, you never know it from the skill checks that uh, I make. <laughs> and uh, your specialty is you are an abjurer, right? Yes, that is correct. I made sure to pick that um, specifically because it it synergizes well with the Eldritch Knight. Because having those protection type of spells and even access to counter spell is just so valuable. Um, that protective stuff is going to help just keep me alive, which is my goal. If I'm alive, I can do damage. If I'm doing damage, that's my job. All right. Um, talk a little bit about uh, Juliet's motivations. So started it out that this was kind of like a job when this all started out. She was sent on a job to do this, and then it turned into a huge adventure of ridiculous proportions and evil, which was completely unplanned. Uh, <laughs> so Juliet's motivation so far has kind of been this I'm kind of stuck in this contract and I have to keep going. But she's also had this in the back of her mind, this need to explore and really experience the world and learn as much as she can. And so far we've been a great number of places and she's learned a whole bunch of spells. She's met a whole bunch of cultures, a whole bunch of people. Um, she's learning quite a lot. And so that's mostly her motivation. That's that's her, her personal motivation is that she wants to learn she wants to experience so that's what she's doing um, but the real the motivation that's like the primary motivator is that she's stuck in this contract with um, all, all the bad guys um, talents. yeah all of them uh, <laughs> to go and do this stuff and she's also quite religious and uh She's been told that her deity desires uh, Runaxis to be freed. Tiamat desires it. So she's kind of going along with that. She's not really a big fan of doing the whole evil thing, but uh, she's, get, she's learning and she is getting uh, the job done. So. so she's kind of justifying all of this by saying, well, this is what Tiamat would want. Exactly. What, what would Tiamat do? <laughs> what color is that bracelet? <laughs> it's, it's uh, I guess it's all the colors, huh? Purple and green. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, talk a little bit about your uh, relationships with the uh, rest of the party here. 
We've kind of already gone over most of the relationships here. Juliet kind of sees a child in Talia. She's at that age where having children is kind of a thing, and she doesn't have a child right now, so Talia is kind of her adopted child. But Talia is growing up very quickly, and Juliet is not exactly a big fan of that. Her newfound independence gets her into a lot of trouble, and Juliet is going to be coming down hard on her soon. Especially... Best of luck with that. Thanks to Vic, who will transition to, who is kind of like an unknown factor still in this whole thing. Uh, she sees an ally in Vic in that she is also a female and also religious and also a fighter caster kind of thing. So there's a lot in common there, but their personalities don't always mix and she is super duper evil which Juliet isn't like super keen about but they're not unfriendly in any sense speaking of unfriendly Alunidas, holy cow Alunidas and Juliet are this star-crossed couple who are destined to marry <laughs> but they hate each other um <laughs> Juliet doesn't like Alunidas um, in the sense she that him, he is well yes but in the sense that he's like this religious um, zealot that's constantly urging people to do bad things and all of this stuff um, Juliet is not a fan of that and she doesn't like Alunidas that way but Alunidas is kind of charming in this awkward weird kind of way and Juliet likes that. And he's the also like the only one who treats Talia as like a child and is willing to help her alongside Juliet to kind of uh, help Talia grow. Be her so, best self. I, I don't know. I don't know what to call them, what the relationship exactly would be. But it's like the parents who hate each other but love each other, uh, love their child more in a, I don't know, maybe a less tragic way. But that, and then Alexander, Alexander has been a challenge for Juliet because Juliet has tried to get like something out of Alexander and it's been very difficult to get anything. And now with this whole dagger demon thing, she's kind of been very suspicious of him. Um, not to the point where she wants to kill him or anything, but now that the demon in the dagger is gone though, Julia is more than happy to see what Alexander has in store if he's ever willing to share any of his uh, story, any of his past, any of his goals, dreams, hopes, etc. She doesn't really know a lot about uh, Alexander, and she is curious about that. And I think that's everyone in the party. Uh, you could always force the issue on that. I have tried, and we have gone over even outside of... Uh, <laughs> gameplay and every time we ask for details to be ironed out they rarely are <laughs> like I still do not know what his deity is I think he said the deity of the road Farkland or whatever I don't even know how you pronounce that um, he's an enigma yes uh, and I wish he would be less of an enigma but maybe maybe spoilers we might be finding out more about him in Kala how does Juliet feel about Talia not having a religion or a god or a deity or anything? Um, I guess... If you're going to be in this house, you're going to worship Tia Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Juliet doesn't see that as a problem because the whole She'll worship come to of love Tiamat... Is eventually, <laughs> it's fine. The worship of Tiamat is like a dragonborn thing, and she doesn't want to force that on Talia. And... All of the other gods, like Tiamat doesn't like an awful lot of gods, so if Talia was to worship a god, uh, it, it might be a good god, and Juliet wouldn't like that. So having no god is, is A-OK -okay in her book. Eventually she needs to come to her senses and, you know, worship a proper deity. But she's young, she doesn't know much about the world yet. Eventually she'll need that blessed spell. <laughs> so it's like Juliet's Catholic and Lunidas is Jewish and you're like trying to let the, the kid like figure out what they want to do that is perfect yes do you think we should get her a hippogriff a griffin or a nightmare Ooh, nightmare uh, a special mount 
<laughs> Nightmare, hundred percent. We are not getting her anything that is larger than a five by five cube. Okay. Well, these are all mounts, so I think they're all perfectly. I mean, maybe we could get a pony nightmare. But Do she already has a mount. But I want to get her a special one. I want her to have a murder pony. She'll what grow out of that nightmare that pony. <laughs> so I need something practical, and you know, um, what's more practical than something that can fly or take her to the ethereal plane? Knives. <laughs> These things all have knives on their feet. I mean, Talia's probably getting a little too big to be riding a war pony around. I don't think Talia's ever going to get big. <laughs> well, she's 13, and, you know, speaking of, you know, Juliet saying, well, I can't, you know, she's getting out of hand. Wait till those hormones kick in. Oh, yeah. She's only 12. No, she's 13. 13? 13. 13? Okay. She's a teenager. <laughs> oh, okay. Ooh. Oof. She, Oof indeed. She would be uh <laughs> I'm I'm still not entirely sure that we're going to be doing a uh like a, a re- any kind of referencing to to her starting her womanhood. Well, I mean, at this point, you know, she and She's the other magic. girls we'll have put would her on be- magic birth control when we get back to a big city. It'll be fine. <laughs> well, she and the other girls would have been taken, you know, away to another classroom to watch that video. <laughs> right? At this point. <laughs> Someone's got to talk to her about that because that's something that she still has zero idea about. No, well, I'm sure well, Julia has Rick. tried telling her about you know the egg laying process and stuff like that. <laughs> and Tali has been like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" You they know, you lay your eggs. The male comes over and looks down his you know his deposit on top of them. That and that takes care of everything. When the... you covered up with mud, you come back in a few weeks. Actually, with a dragon, I'm pretty sure that the fertilization happens internally. Yeah, no, they these are, are dragon born. That's it would still happen. Internally. I'm assuming dragon born are like fish. Um, dragon born are not like fish, <laughs> but uh, also you, you call Juliet Tail Scale as the last name. Dragon borns don't have tails. Don't they have little stumps? I thought they no. had tails. Nope, they don't have tails. Half dragons. That's do. upsetting. Isn't I it? always, I always pictured Juliet with like a glorious tail. No. Uh, How would you sit awful. in a chair? You put the tail. You, well, okay. It depends on the <laughs> chair. How <cats> sit? <laughs> yeah, you wrap it around your butt. She yeah, turns into you just a wrap loaf it around your belly. Or, oh, I see. It still seems rather uncomfortable. Agreed. You guys have no imagination. But I think uh, we should start Talia about? off on a hippogriff. And then, in a few levels, we get her a griffin. Because, you know, griffins would be a little harder to manage. You know, they're bloodthirsty in a way that hippogriffs aren't. And then, you know, I think maybe around level 12, we go ahead and get her a nightmare pony. Uh, that's going to be a hard veto from me. No. I mean, Talia's then... going with all the money. I feel like it's yeah, she could be probably just choice buy either herself. way. <laughs> she like that's like the equivalent of like you know showing up one day after school and you got a tattoo yeah <laughs> I got uh, the actually, money I'll do what I want I had two tattoos by the time I graduated high school wow nice nice the thing about the nightmare is that it requires a pretty nasty sacrifice in order to make it loyal to someone so that's some, I think that's something that uh, Lunadas would be willing to do I don't know about uh, Juliet what's the sacrifice you know, like a baby or something. It's a fiend, the nightmare. So, okay, no, Talia would be willing to do that. Okay. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I gotta kill somebody? Well, it's not a big deal. Or, you know, you could make your own by torturing ritually a pegasus and cutting off its wings. <laughs> Talia could never do that. She has no problem with animals. It's it's purely humans that, right, and, yeah. and humanoids. Yeah. A nightmare could be summoned from the lower planes, but unless a worthy sacrifice is offered to it as food upon its arrival, the nightmare displays no special loyalty to the creature it serves. So, that, that's why I'm thinking we wait a little while. You know, we got to build up to that. <laughs> and then, in addition to Abbott, I think we could get you, like, a, do- a death dog or a hellhound or something. Death she, dog? She'll have, like, the, the hellish menagerie petting zoo. Mm-hmm. I still really want to get Talia a displacer beast as a pet. That would be pretty cool. And I have wanted, 
I have wanted a Displacer Beast as a pet for, for one of my D&D campaigns since I found out that they were so adorable. A death dog is a two-headed dog. That's Isn't adorable. Isn't that a... Derberus? It's Cerberus. That's three. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, Cerberus is three. Derberus is two. Because Derberus. Derberus. He's still there for the du- duo. It's there you go. a two-headed hound that roams plains, deserts, and the Underdark. Hate burns in a death dog's heart. And a taste for humanoid flesh drives it to attack travelers and explorers. Death dog's life at... carries a foul disease. <laughs> Sounds perfect. I just, I just posted something in Discord, and... I love it. I want one. Oh, that is adorable. Oh, Displacer Cat. Yeah, well, I mean, Displacer Beasts are basically just eight-legged. Panthers. Yes. Yeah, eight-legged panthers that are a little demonic. I mean, they're super and cute. They have tentacles. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Juliet, what did you choose at eighth level? Oh, <laughs> oh right, boy. That. <laughs> I got. <laughs> we got way off topic there. Uh, yeah. Uh, Juliet, I uh, took another level of Abjurationist Wizard, bumping her up to level 5 Wizard, level 3 Fighter. Um, and the only thing she gets from that is she gets more spell slots, specifically the third level ones, which means that she gets to get, pick two spells, of which they're the two important ones are Counterspell and Fireball. Yes! So, taking those, no more messing around, uh... I know I've cast Counterspell in the past in one of the episodes, or two of the episodes, but it actually, technically I shouldn't have had those third level slots until this level, because of the way multiclassing works, and I just am, was wrong about it. So, uh... We'll retcon now, that. Now legitimate. Yeah, yeah, we'll retcon that, and you all died in the Phase Shrine Temple. Alright, sounds good. <laughs> I no. need every, go ahead and roll me 46. <laughs> All right, so uh, anything else that you want to say about Juliet? Uh, No, other than I am looking forward to seeing where the party goes and what's going to happen ahead. Not just for Juliet, but for the entire party. That's it. That's that's it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Dungeons & Debacles podcast. If I could ask a halfling size favor, give us a five-star rating and review on iTunes. It's the best way to support us. New episodes come out every Monday, so make sure to check your podcast app. Do you have an idea to make the podcast better? Tell us about it on Twitter or Facebook. You can also check out our website to see all the maps, lore, and characters at DungeonsAndDebaclesPodcast.com. And now a word from our fantasy sponsor. Want to throw hatchets? We got hatchets, and you can throw them at the hatchet throw. Bring your own hatchet or use some of ours. We don't care. We got big hatchets and small hatchets. We even have very small axes. Want to throw daggers? We don't have daggers. We have hatchets, and you can throw them inside our building. You can throw them at stumps with red circles painted on them. We also got stumps shaped like half orcs because they are attacking us, but they don't have red circles on them. So come to the hatchet throw in downtown Asheville. We also have L, wine, and me. People say hatchet throwing and L is not a good combination, but what do they know? We also have hatchets to throw, but no daggers. Hatchet throw. The music you heard on this episode was Teller of the Tales by Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 License. CreativeCommons.org slash licenses slash buy slash 3.0.